I want to talk about a problem today that um, it has more general ramifications, but I'm going to put it in the context of climate change, which is undeniably a very important social challenge which, which we face. And the question is, what can we as economic scientists contribute to thinking about this problem? And what are the challenges of it? And what type of tools can, uh, can we use? And what kind of insights can we bring to bear? Um, I would say that through the course of my year, this might be the, uh, my career, this might be the hardest problem which I've ever wrestled with. Uh, but it's uh, also obviously a tremendously important one. So um, in general, confronting policy uncertainty, there is a tension. And we kind of feel this, you kind of see this tension all the time. There, there are many phenomena in economics and elsewhere which we have a limited understanding by, 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 which, by which policies operate. In the case of economics, by the way, policy influences economic outcomes. On the other hand, there's a public, there's, uh, uh, there's political leaders, there's governmental policymakers. They want answers. And there's a danger that they're going to go to people who provide the answers even when the answers aren't well grounded. And that's, and, and, and that's a huge tension. How can we credibly be, be true to our knowledge base and at the same time produce calculations, computations, insights that are valuable in economic policy and, the, and that they will take seriously. Um, there's this um, story that I heard from one of my collaborators. It was about a president, Lyndon Johnson, who was probably president before you were born. I was alive then. Anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so Lyndon Johnson was, uh, he came out of Texas and he was a cattle rancher. Uh, before he became a politician okay, and, and, and subsequently president. And, and, and he had economic advisors, and the economic advisors were like, he asked for advice, and they would say, they start hedging their answers a little bit, well, we kind of think this, but we're not 100% sure, blah, blah, blah. And he turned to them impatiently and said, ranges are for cows, give me the number. And that's kind of the thing you're fighting against, in the sense that policymakers want the number. They don't want like, you know, any hedges and stuff like that. And, and, uh, but on the other hand, how much knowledge do we really have on these issues? And how do we wrestle, bring these, you know, how do we tr put these things in the, uh, together? And so I have examples. There's monetary policy, which we could talk about. That was Milton Friedman, a uh, long time ago, coined this fra uh, uh, phrase called long and variable lags because we didn't fully understand the monetary transmission mechanism. If, if, you, if you look at financial market oversight, so obviously the financial crisis put on the radar screen a lot of important questions. We had to rush to a bunch of answers. Uh, I mean, a rush to policy um, responses. But, uh, those, but, but, but our fundamental understanding of, of the phenomenon was, uh, was somewhat limited. And today I want to talk about climate change, which, which I believe the same is true for. So um, here's what haunts me sometimes. Hayek, who is on the Committee of Social Thought here at the University of Chicago, uh, among other places. Um, uh, so the interesting story about Hayek. So, so Hayek won the Nobel Prize in 74. He shared it with this other, other person, Myrdal. It was kind of a weird, awkward marriage. But Hayek wins the Nobel Prize for Economic Sciences, and his essay is, is economics really a science? It's kind of an interesting ch challenge there. Um, I don't, there's, there's, there's lots about the essay I personally don't get, uh, I, I disagree with. Hayek thought a field that, I, that, uh, that I'm interested in, econometrics, it was, was complete, um, and was, was, was entirely empty. He thought that mathematics was for languages and not for quantitative research and the like. So I, I, I don't claim to agree with a lot of what's in the essay, but there's this one, these sentences that I think are really important. Even if true sciences recognize the limits of studying human behavior, as long as the public has expectations, people are going to come forward and they're going to pre either pretend or actually believe they can do more to meet the uh, than is what really is uh, in their power. This this pretense of knowledge itself can be counterproductive for, the, uh, for society and, and and potentially harmful. So how do we guard against that? And that's the real challenge here. Okay, so I like to build mathematical models like other economists. Uh, I'm going to spare you the equations, um, although I would. Uh, um, uh, but these, I, and there's kind of a 
description of these that I kind of have grown to like. Um, quantitative storytelling. So these are mathematical models. So they look all kind of formal, sophisticated. Um, we, we have um, uh, uh, very, very impressive at, at some level. They're mathematical with numerical inputs. They, um, they're there to further our understanding and, in many cases, to support policy analysis. Of course, uh, you know, for monetary policy, the, uh, uh, all the different feds, regional feds, the ECB all have kind of their model builders. The same is true of you know, climate scientists. The same is true across lots of, uh, uh, yeah, the same is true of, the, uh, of, of other entities in government, including the CBO and the like. So, but so I, so I call this quantitative storytelling um, because these models are not really full descriptions of reality. We make a bunch of simplifying assumptions in order to make them tractable. Uh, we, we make simplifications to make them revealing and insightful, to be transparent, that we can do stuff with them and really get an un uh, understanding. If there were complex descriptions of reality, they wouldn't be very useful anyway. But they are simplifications. What are their ingredients? Substantive knowledge. There's some type of model formalism to them and empirical evidence. And the, form and the formalism you know, gives them structure and, and helps to facilitate communication. And we certainly want to draw on empirical evidence. But the models are in some sense wrong. They're wrong by design. To say they're wrong is, is by itself not much of an insight. So how, what do we do with them? Interesting question. Okay. How about uncertainty? Where, uh, where does uncertainty emerge here? So now I want to think about the story. These models as kind of quantitative storytelling with multiple stories. So different researchers have, build different models. The models have different implications. Maybe you know, different academic papers have their own fate. You know, do, do, uh, do formal analysis of these each different stories. But if you want to engage in sensible and prudent policy analysis, we have to somehow figure out a way to combine these stories, to think across stories and think about implications across stories. Not necessarily buy just into one or the other, because in many sets of circumstances, the overall, uh, there's no reason to be all in on one or the other. So looking across models is a very important task, I believe. Each model has so-called randomness. So, there's, so usually when we think about uncertainty, we think about things with probability distributions, normal distributions, and things like that. Well, these models have random impulses. They have things where you have fully probabilistic specifications that require numerical inputs. But there's multiple, of, multiple versions of them. And each such model is itself an abstraction. As I said, these stories are not really intended to be recordings of actual histories or complete descriptions of reality, such as both infeasible and would not be terribly insightful. So how do we use models that are wrong? That's kind of an interesting challenge. So uncertainty, we typically think about it in economics classes when we teach about risk. We always use this term risk. And, I, and, and risk is only part of the story here. Risk is much more about the second bullet point here. This pointer is supposed to do something fancy. Let's see if it works. Yeah, there. Risk is that one. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> but looking across models and how to take into this abstraction question, I mean, these are, are, are also a very important task. In many respects, maybe even more important. So let me put a picture here. This is called the dangers of being naive. Okay, I can write down some mathematical formalization of some story. I can look, but you know, by the time I turn it into these equations, I can make them look really fancy, sophisticated, uh, uh, rigorous, and the like. Um, but, and then I can just go with it and say, well, I've got this great formal structure. Let's just go all the way. Let's just go all in. And what's the dangers of doing that? So um, I've got a painting here by uh, Latour. And we've got a person here, all the way on your right, who's, who, who uh, thinks he's playing a fair card game. There's a dealer with somewhat shifty eyes. Someone's pouring some booze and uh, uh, with, perhaps is uh, in, in, in on what's about to happen. And then there's this person all the way on the left with some funny business going on behind his back. Now, of course, this is not surprisingly, this is called the cheat. There's uh, two versions of this painting in two different mu museums, actually. And there's e e even been speculation that, that one of the two paintings itself is fraudulent. They're, they're slightly different. But, but um, the reason I'm putting this on here is we, we can use models. 
go all in with them, like the person on the right is thinking that, 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 that he's playing a fair part card game and maybe using informal probabilistic calculations to assess the quality of the hand. But we better, we might want to also be, have our eyes open to how that model might be wrong. In this case, it could be disastrously wrong because of the uh, uh, potential cheat going on. So when we use these models as these stories, these quantitative stories, we need to keep our eyes open on what could go wrong with them. That's really an important task. Okay, so what type of tools do we want to bring to bear to problems like this? So this is a case where bringing insights from lots of literatures can really, um, can really be important. So for me, I find statistics to be very, very useful. Uh, I, you know, they think hard about going, uh, to, you know, looking for evidence across models. There's this field out of, out of, uh, out of engineering called control theory that's is very, that kind of figures out how to use dynamic models in sensible ways, but, uh, it should, but uh, with uh, formal mathematical underpinnings. And then there's economics. Economists think about this issue as well. And there's insights from all of these that are, uh, that are quite useful. The way that economists often pose this is how do we make decisions um, that are, quote, rational. I, yeah, the term rational is gets abused all the time. Maybe it's better to think of these as sensible once we put all these complexities on the table. Um, <clears throat> so what's one set of tools? The so-called decision theory under uncertainty. And this has a long, yeah, as I say, this has, there's, there's various different versions of this that, 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 are, that are really, you know, each, each with their own set of insights. Well, there's another stuff which we're familiar with, uh, any of you that have taken investment classes, and that is asset value valuation under uncertainty. Now, normally we think of asset valuation un under uncertainty as a set of tools to use for, you know, doing value, uh, for understanding how financial markets work um, and, and the like. But those tools are designed to confront uncertainty. They're also useful for thinking about social valuation. So assets we can think of broadly, financial, of course, maybe physical, human, organization, or even environmental versions of capital. Associated with each such asset, we can think about prospective sequence of net payoffs or investments. But these can, these can now be social investments. Um, so in the case of climate change, we're, we're, we, we, we might imagine the consequences of doing things like emitting CO2 into the atmosphere. That's going to have social, that's going to have environmental consequences down the road and economic consequences down the road as well. So what, what, where asset valuation comes into play is it helps us assess investment opportunities in the face of an uncertain future. But these can be social investments, not just private investments. These two different sets of tools turn out to be kind of, in many respects, symbiotically linked. Both uncertainty uh, is central for, and kind of bringing them together can be really quite fruitful. Right. So I want to think about navigating uncertainty. How do we go beyond standard approaches? So as I said, the standard approach we, that's taught in microeconomics is the so-called risk aversion and the like. Those are situations in which we give people probabilities, we give them some type of objective function and have them go forward. We figure out optimal investment strategies, we figure out uh, implications for pricing, we do a variety of things. But the models we use in practice are misspecified and there's ambiguity among which of the multiple models is present. So now we want to push beyond this notion of we can just write down probabilities of everything and, 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 and proceed forward with the calculation. And and push back from that a little bit. So this is, I want to put this under the heading of so-called robust approaches. The idea is we want to use models in sensible ways rather than discard them. Probably the statistics are still ought to come into play because we want to somehow bound the type of uh, uh, uncertainties which we want to entertain. Instead of, instead, of a, instead of getting precise probability statements, we still need to put some type of bound. Because if we think anything can happen and we don't want to make, make any type of assessment, then why get up in the morning? You know? it's, it's, it's just like every, every, everything's hopeless. So that's not very productive. So we still have to bound things. And, and so probably in statistics is still very, very useful. There's still a type of aversion that can comes into play. Before we talk about risk aversion, but here it's an aversion to a dislike of uncertainty about probabilities of our future events. And what does the implementation of these type of ideas involve? It says, well, you go into your 
your, your models, your multiple stories, and you start looking at the uncertainty components that have the most adverse consequences for the decision maker. And, and, and you focus your attention on those. If, if, if there's components that have little consequence, um, you know, even, though, even if you're uncertainty, uncertainty, why worry about them? The ones you want to you know, really target are the ones that have the most adverse consequences. And there's ways to do this formally and systematically. And, that's, uh, and that turns out to be a, um, a very useful perspective. OK. Uncertainty, climate change, and economic valuation. So the whole issue about climate change when it comes to economists has to do with things called externalities. This is a problem which people speculate that there's so-called external forces in play that prevents markets from working perfectly. Our so-called welfare theorems, uh, there's a breakdown in, in, in them. The idea is that the market valuation alone fails to account to the full social impact of human inputs in the climate. So when we're looking at emissions today, we can, you know, there'll be market prices for various different things. But maybe the social price should be different than the market price, just because of uh, uh, the market itself is failing to take into account the, um, external, the external effect that the collective human action has on the environment. And the whole issue then is how big is that and how to address it. Uncertainty can have a big impact on the measurement of what's called the social cost of carbon. Now, what is the social cost of carbon? Actually, it's one of the most abused terms in this literature, but it does have some formal, there are ways to make it formal. Um, the simplest way to think about it for our purposes today is the following. Suppose that I figure out um, what is the uh, most efficient level of, uh, of economic activity, including emissions, as it impacts the, uh, uh, as it impacts the environment. And this, and, and this is a social calculation. Now, from that social calculation, I can, go through, I can go through and start looking at what's the kind of margarita substitution between things like emissions and other consumption goods and the like. I can start figuring out prices. I do the same type of price calculations as I see in microeconomics, but I'm doing it you know, in, 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 con in conjunction with social valuation. This is, a, and this is what people typically call a, 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 um, this is a notion of a social cost of carbon. Now, this can be translated into a, a tax policy. And there's a, the, the so-called Pagu is famous for uh, coming up with a way to tax these externalities from a long time ago. Now, we can, there's lots of complicated issues about how one can implement a tax on, on, on carbon emissions. Uh, there's questions, how can we harmonize them? How can we get all countries to buy into it? What's the right way to, uh, um, um, uh, what's the right level to set it at? And the, and the, and the, and the like, so there's lots of important you know, issues about implementation, which I'm going to be sidestepping here. I, but I am going to use this construct of a social cost of carbon in order to show you how uncertainty can really matter in terms of figuring out its, its value. You know, the social cost of carbon numbers used to be posted routinely on the EPA web pages um, with a previous administration that had a little bit more tolerance for science. Um, unfortunately, those numbers, if you kind of open the black box of them, for a, 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 there, there's a lot of kind of uh, pretty arbitrary stuff going into them. So it, it, to me, there's a big concern there about a, a, a kind of projection of um, ex, um, excess knowledge relative to what we really um, relative to our full understanding of things. Okay. So, so I think it's good to kind of open up that black box going forward. Now, what's going to happen in this problem is there'll be two inter interacting sources of uncertainty that are really important here. One is we're doing emissions of CO2 today. That's going to affect the environment in the future. Right? It's going to affect so-called, you know, perhaps we can think of temperature as some type of uh, summary statistic, although it's going to ha have other environmental effects today. But those impacts are going to play out over time, over, over, over horizons, and potentially very, very long horizons. So, so in order to understand that type of uncertainty, we have to, you know, this is where geophysics comes into play. It helps us think about that mapping from CO2 emissions to temperature changes in the future. And so that's one source of this uncertainty, broadly speaking. Now, once you change the temperature in the future, that's going to affect economic opportunities in the future. <coughs> Economists sometimes refer to this as damages. Okay? Well, so how do we really assess, once we change the temperature, what impacts that's going to have in terms of our economic opp opportunities and social well-being? 
that also has uncertainty, maybe arguably even more uncertainty attached to it. Why? Because we have to think through, we have to make, you have to make speculations about technological progress in the future, you have to make speculations about ad adaptation, and, and a variety of things come into play there. So there's, you know, there's, there's two sources, sources, of, sources of uncertainty here. And a point I want to make here that's really important for, uh, for this problem is that we can't just think of these as adding them together. I take the amount from here and the amount here, just sum them up, and that's the uncertainty for this problem. These are interacting. I think of these as more duplicative than additive. That is the fact that if we have this uncertainty in the CO2 emissions today, it's going to kind of potentially magnify uh, the, uh, the uncertainties associated with, the, the, with these economic damages in the future. So it's important to think about these things, about their interacting effects, because that, uh, that's, that's uh, tremendously central to the, um, assessing the consequences of uncertainty here. OK, climate science and uncertainty. First, I'm going to appeal to authority. Uh, there's a paper here by Alan et al. I think the et al. has about 30 or 50 names of climate scientists, uh, which I would not repeat for you today. But, but there's a lot, and it's, it's pretty well understood that there's uncertainty in this mapping from how much we omit into the atmosphere today to its consequences of the environment going forward in the future, or say temperature in this case. So this is just a, just a quote from their paper that the uh, eventual global mean temperature associated with a given stabilization target um, remains uncertain, and this is going to complicate what we want to do in terms of policy. So um, how do we extract evidence from geophysics? Well, that's an interesting challenge. It's many geophysics models are highly complex. They have both dynamic and spatial domains to them. Some of them, you, you turn them loose on computers, you wait you know, weeks or months for solutions. They're highly nonlinear. Uh, they have these patterns that are, say, approximately chaotic. Um, and, and so you can't just take a geophysics model and stick it inside an economic model and go to town. That's just not, that's just not gonna happen anytime soon. You've gotta live off, live off approximations. And geophysicists themselves realize that to go forward, they need to go from these very complex models they build into things that we can actually sink our teeth into. And there's this line of research by Matthews et al. that does the, that, that's, that, that's all about approximation. And I'm going to give you the simplest version of this approximation for, for purposes of today's conversation. So think about emitting temperature, uh, uh, carbon emissions today, and suppose that they have long-term consequences on temperature. So some carbon emitted today is going to impact temperature, not only tomorrow, but over all future time periods. This is, a, of course, this is a big simplification. For an economist, uh, now here's where geophysics and economics is very different. For a geophysicist, long term is over many, many centuries. They crank their models out for a long time. For economists, if we can guess what's going on in the next five decades, we, we, it would be remarkable. So, so, so our notion of long term is really quite different. And so for us, these are kind of long term effects. Um, uh, of course, for geophysicists, they're kind of more middle term effects, uh, approximations, which you're thinking about. So, this, so let's just take this rather stark simplification just to kind of how to summarize evidence. So roughly speaking for this conversation, changing temperature today is going to have this permanent consequence on, uh, so it's changing emissions today with this permanent consequence on temperature. But the question is, let me try this again. That, that beta, that guy. What's that? So what, Math what Matthews and other people have done is taken this approximation and start looking across these different climate models, simulate from, take simulations from these very complex climate models, record, roughly speaking, what the temperature change is over a long time horizon uh, to, uh, to changes in emissions. So they try, I, I, they try to get us kind of um, numbers for that beta there coming off of different models. So thus we can start talking about model comparisons going across a whole bunch of geophysics models now. Okay. So here's a paper that came out in 2017. It takes this climate sensitivity parameter. How much does temperature respond to emissions? It just tabulates them across a bunch of model simulations, going across models and going across certain type of unknown initial conditions. 
And the key thing here is the blue line is actually the, uh, is, is, is actually the histogram across the models. I, I, I just superimpose a normal density here on top of it to make it a, a smooth counterpart. Because in, in our computations, that's a little bit simple for us to use that. But the key thing here is we don't know with very much precision um, what the impact is going to be on the environment going forward over many, over, over many time periods. It could be substantial. You know, it could be this kind of 2.5 to 3 range, or it could be relatively modest. We have lots of confidence that there is a human input uh, imprint on the environment. But once you start translating this into quantitative magnitudes, which is if you want to do quantitative policy analysis, this becomes an important, this, this becomes an important calculation. So one possibility, and this is what's done in a fair number of studies, is, 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 is to take that histogram, find the midpoint, and just go with that. But we want to do something else. We, we really, really want to acknowledge the uncertainty and, 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 and look at its consequences. OK, so that's part of the story. Now, there's been a lot of discussion recently about what's called carbon budgeting. It's meant to simplify the whole policy discussion. It says, you know, economists can debate about damages and adaptation and stuff like that. But, but if we make the uh, world two degrees warmer, it's going to be fried and useless to us. So let's just impose a constraint, uh, a constraint on carbon emissions in order, in order to ensure that we're not going to hit this, uh, 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 this two period, uh, sorry, this two degree change. Uh, which, right? And so that's like a carbon budgeting. And now if I take carbon budgeting in conjunction to that thing I call the Matthews approximation, it's like saying that I'm going to impose a restriction on the amount of uh, stuff I can emit overall, over now and all future time periods. It's like imposing a constraint on that. And so if I actually knew what that beta was, uh, I would be right back into a very, very famous model from economics by Harold Hotelling about exhaustible resources. I, I would just say, well, here's this finite stock of resources that, 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 that I can deplete, and what's the most uh, socially efficient way to deplete it? And Hotelling wrote a beautiful paper on exactly addressing that problem. So we can be very, very close to you know, appealing to earlier economic insights. However, we don't know beta. If we knew, the uncertainty about beta kind of uh, makes that simplicity, you know, pulls that simplicity off the table. Right? But of course, carbon budgeting is a very extreme form. Economists prefer to think about there being some type of trade-off going forward in terms of damages. And, and the calculations I'm going to show you in a few minutes uh, don't, don't go all the way to this extreme. But you know, it's, they could be extended to this. Uh, but, but, but that's going to be an implicit statement of what we believe about damages in order, in order to get to the carbon budgeting. But there's lots of discussion these days about carbon budgeting as the uh, framework for thinking about policy. But even with carbon budgeting, there's a key source of uncertainty. That beta parameter uncertainty is still important, is, is, is truly central. So we want to go beyond carbon budgeting, follow some of the economics literature on this. Um, and for this, we have to model something that economists call, that economists call damages. Now, damages right now is not something that is derived from, from very deep principles. Or there it's, it, it, um, it's fairly ad hoc modeling shortcut. And down the road, hopefully, we can do much better in our way of treating this. Um, there's, um, okay. And then we're going to incorporate damages in order to measure this social, uh, in order to figure out the social cost of climate change. We need to know the damage a a aspect of it. And here, there uh, uncertainty comes into play as well. So first of all, let me tell you, uh, we're going to have to conf confront this with the economic model. I thought I'd show you a diagram of the model rather than uh, all the mathematical equations. It's actually a rel relatively simple model. So here's the, here's the first piece of it. I'm, I'm going to imagine I've got some type of productive physical capital going on here. Um, that capital produces output. The output can be turned into new investment that it, it invests in future capital. Or it can also go into consumption. And that then influences economic well-being. So that's one piece of it. Now, I want to take that model and I make it a little bit more complicated by allowing an exploration. So if we keep track of reserves, oil and you know, coal reserves and the like, they're not fixed things. There's, uh, there's efforts put in exploration, new discoveries and the like. So, so, so we're going to take part of this output of this technology and, and make, it invest, make it an investment in terms of enhancing the stock of reserves. 
So that's going to show up there as well. And then for the stack of reserves, we're going to draw down emissions. That's going to also affect economic well-being. So it's like these two sources of well-being here, emissions and consumption. And then there's this production going on here. So this is a very simplified model, but one to get us off the ground. Now, so far, there's no climate externality here. I got, I can turn this model loose, uh, and this would be a model which the so-called invisible hand would work fine. Markets would do their thing, and, you, and, and we would get good social outcomes. It's ignoring the fact that emissions damage the climate. Okay. So now we can stick that in there. One way to do it is, from reserves, these emissions not only, yeah, I, I might like to um, drive my car and you know, emit gas, and, and, and that's part of my consumption. But at the same time, I could be damaging the climate. And that's this uh, line going from reserves to, to uh, the red climate arrow. And when I change the climate, that might reduce the uh, productive capacity of the economy going forward. Okay. This alternative way to do this is I can um, instead imagine that um, I, I've got, it's, it's going to directly affect, if I damage the environment, it's going to directly affect the economic well-being. And, and, and for some purposes, these are almost equivalent, uh, but, there's a, but, but these are two different channels one can think about proceeding. So the externality comes into place once I stick that red circle there. Because at the same time, I'm, I have these emissions going into you know, uh, consumption, I'm also damaging the climate. And that's the part that markets could miss. And that's the part we might need to think of, uh, you know, design policies to confront. Okay? So that's basically the model. OK, now damages. So here, here our, our economic thinking right now is, re is, is kind of relatively crude. But this is a stark simplification, but one that's used in some calculations. So this is kind of going to show you the following. Follow this blue line, for instance. The blue line is a line that really comes out of uh, work by Nordhaus, who um, I guess last year won a Nobel Prize for his work in this area. And he, and he kind of conjectured that the, uh, as, it, as, as we push temperature out in the future, basically the amount of reduction in economic well-being would follow that blue line. How do you figure this out? Well, he does surveys of experts and other stuff like this, and that helps him, and, and, and that leads him to that. There was another economist, um, Marty Weitzman, who says, wait, 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 things could be, you're, you're, you're way understating the possibilities here, and because of uh, a variety of other considerations, damages could be a whole lot more different, including uncertainty. Damages could instead be along this line. And this isn't literally Weitzman's line, but it's, but, uh, but it's kind of motivated by his constructions to some extent. And then I talked before about a carbon budget. So what's that? That's like taking this two degrees point and just sticking a vertical line. So it's, so it's just why I think a carbon budget has an extreme form of damages here, where I kind of hit that, uh, uh, that vertical line and I just drop off a cliff. Okay. Now, how do we know whether we're on the blue or the red line? I can look at evidence, you know, I'm a good statistician. Well, we don't have a whole lot of historical experience about this. So that's, this is not something I can just go you know, run, you know, turn this loose on an empiricist. Now, you know, one can look a little bit of like cross-region evidence and make certain type of guesses about this, but that's, but that's tough to get do. So, the, so you know, we may live in a data-rich environment, but the data doesn't help. That data richness doesn't help us very much on this one. So, that's, that's, so this just kind of illustrate a range of uncertainty coming out of this literature. OK. Now, how is this going to work? So now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take that economic model. It's got, I'm going to take into account all the kind of climate pieces. Um, I'm going to take into account both sources of uncertainty here, part coming from the geophysics, that beta coefficient, and part coming from the economic uncertainty, the damages. And then, and then I'm going to put them together. I'm going to analyze this model. It turns out that the social cost of carbon I talked about, I can represent that just like I represent an asset price, like a present value uh, on the relationship for an asset price. It's got, a, it's, it's got an asset pricing rep representation for it. Um, 
And so, and so there's the social cash flow that has to do with these economic damages as they play out over time. There's uncertainty there. And then, and then we have to evaluation of that uncertainty. In the environmental economics literature, there's all these arguments. What is the discount factor? Um, many of them are not the most coherent arguments. But if you know from an investments class, you can't really ask that, answer that question without asking what uncertainty are you really exposed to. And, 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 and you know, risk return trade-offs require understanding the exposures. And here we want to think about uncertainty more broadly, these uncertainty trade-offs. So we have to, uh, that's going to affect the valuation. How exposed, in what way is it exposed to that uncertainty changes the valuation. So instead of there being this kind of uh, simple discount rate, the way we're going to do these valuation adjustments is we're going to produce a adjusted probability measure. And that adjusted probability measure is kind of what comes out of solving our model and, and, and kind of figuring out you know, which pieces are the most concerned for the decision maker. And they're going to produce these new probabilities that, that, that encode in them uncertainty adjustments. So that's going to be kind of a mathematical tool. It's a, it's, it's a mathematical trick, very much like the trick that's used in pricing derivative claims in, 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 in the field of finance. But here, as I say, it's applied to social valuation. Okay. So kind of the way this is going to work is that uh, the, uh, this type of adjustment over, over 50 years is going to be fairly modest, and over 100 years is going to be much more substantial. So what's going to happen is, Think of this as that climate sensitivity parameter before I told, before I, or, or that normal density approximation to it. Right? And then I'm going to make this conservative adjustment here. I'm going to say, well, it, that might not be right uh, because of various forms of uncertainty. So I'm going to treat it as if it was this red line. It's not that I think it's a red line. I'm just making that as an adjustment in, in order to implement a little bit of extra caution because I don't know for sure that, uh, I, I, how to weight these alternative climate models. If I play this out to 100 years, then the adjustment gets much bigger. Off of 100 years, we're now in ranges under which damages are potentially a much, an even more spectacular thing. And, 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 th and this becomes substantial. Right? So these are like calculations done for, for, uh, to try to sort out what the efficient, uh, what the efficient um, socially efficient strategies are. This is just kind of a, a, a core piece of things. Now, I'm doing this off of, these are kind of prices off of the socially efficient allocation, taking into account the externality. If I had not taken into, uh, into, the, into account the climate externality, these things would have been very, very dramatic. You know, by, yeah, by year 50, we, we, we would have uh, fried the planet. So these would have been spectacular at that point. So these are like inputs, but these, but, but, this, but these are key inputs in terms of the calculations. So now I'm going to do the social, social cost of carbon. This model has, like I talked about, this kind of hoteling flavor to it in the sense of um, damages. As I, as, I, as I start emitting more and more carbon, uh, I'm getting more and more in those severe damage range. As a consequence, the so-called social cost of carbon is going to increase uh, out of that model from from numbers today to much more substantial ones as they play out over 100 years. So this, you know, I'm referring to this as total because under you know, some of our calculations, that piece of it's coming from uncertainty. So if I'd ignored the uncertainty, which many studies like to do, I would have netted this red line out completely and just shifted the whole thing downwards. Now, now, I'm not here to tell you I know exactly how, how cautious society should be in, play, um, in face of uncertainty. I'm just here to show you it can matter. And there's a set of mathematical tools that allow us to assess how much it matters. And this is an illustration of that. And, and it could have very, very big impacts in terms of these social calculations. Just as you know, risk adjustments you see in uh, capital markets classes can have big, can have big effects sometimes. Right? Now look, let's, uh, let's look at the emissions trajectory. So, so, so suppose that me, as a, as a policymaker, I say, well, maybe I don't know stuff, but who cares? I look at the emissions comparison for that scenario, and I just go straight down that red line. Now I say, well, I'm not really sure what, the, uh, uh, what that beta parameter is. I'm not really sure which of those damage specifications is the correct one. And, this, and that's, um, that's going to push me down to the blue line. 
Uh, one thing I left out here, and let me try to fill it in now. I should have had a picture to illustrate this. You know, remember those two different damage functions I had? Let's see if I pull this back quickly, sorry. Should have left this out. Yeah, here. So we start off waiting across these two damages specifications 50 50, and then to make this cautious adjustment, well, if, uh, if, if, if it's uh, your shifted, uh, uh, the ambiguity adjusted pro probabilities shift you more towards, the uh, more towards the high damage range. Not because you believe that, but because, because that's a cautious thing to be doing. Right. So anyway, this is a set of tools that allow us to think about mapping these uncertain inputs into social calculations. And that's the thing I really want to be selling here. So that's the neutrality, and so, so when there's aversion, then we have a much more ca cautious trajectory for the, uh, um, for the emissions. Okay. Now, these, th these emission scenarios are, decli are declining here, in part because I haven't stuck on the table here some future technological progress that's going to help solve all these environmental problems. Um, with that on there, it, it puts in future calculations, it, it, um, it definitely will be, that would change its downward trajectory potentially uh, in ways that could be quite important. Okay. So, um, more generally, you know, I, I've sketched out a simple model here, but there's going to be future responses to climate change, and, and, and we're in the process now of figuring out ways to incorporate some of these. You know, there's going to be energy transitions, or there'll be, that's part of adaptation in uh, uh, indus industry transitions, um, you, know, you know, policy changes, ad adaptation, and the like. Integrating these things is, is, is certainly what we want to be doing, and I think it's very, very important. Every time we introduce one of these new channels, though, new sources of uncertainty come into play. And they're going to interact in potentially subtle ways with the other components as well. So yes, it's absolutely important that we enrich this, uh, uh, this type of framework, but uncertainty is not going to, disappear, not going to magically disappear on us. Um, I'm getting messages that I've almost talked too long. So let me... Um, End with the following. The United, um, America doesn't have a lot of great philosophers. So I, so I decided to pick my favorite. It was, it was uh, and here it is. Mark Twain. Education is a path from cocky ignorance to miserable uncertainty. <laughs> so... Uncertainty can be challenging, maybe in some sense miserable, but there's also tools to think about it, to address, uh, to address it and to cope with it. And not only, not only these risk tools, which you typically see, but ones that help us understand uh, uh, unknown models, ones that help us understand models that are misspecified, and ones that can help us address important policy questions.